hello, we're back. We got we're things back. set. Live, live. No producers, no, uh, no, no one behind the cameras, just me. I'm here too. Set the All right, we're back. Well, anyways, hey, everybody, thank you. Jump over to this, this stream here. Yes, we, you can tell our primary job is not television or live streaming. It is uh, messing around with tech. Okay, cool. Sorry about that, folks. I was so excited to get started talking that, you know, it just uh, just uh, flustered me. Messing around. Okay. Yes, we we are live. We are live. We're on the right channel. Everybody in chat, say hello. See if you're there. I think we got some folks from Sneak on, Eric. So anyways, let me let me reintroduce you. So we got some people might have been waiting over there. Anyways, but we today we have Thomas, who's a part uh, partner architect at Sneak, focusing on Dev SecOps ecosystem, and Docker, of course, his favorite his favorite partner. Yes. All right. Much love. Um, in his spare time, he loves uh, discovering new pizza and taco joints around Boston and then escaping into the mountains to hike and to ski and to do all kinds of fun stuff that I should do more of for sure. Yeah. yeah well, what mountains are you going to go to in Texas? What? Yeah, they're they're not mountains. They're hills. They're hills here. We have the, we have the hill country here. Yeah, I, I talked to local. I mean, I, I consider myself a local. I've been here about 25 years or so. But um, yeah, we don't we don't have mountains like uh, you folks up there in the in the nice northeast. We have we have nice rolling hills. Mm -hmm. not, not many places to go skiing. And another fun fact about Texas that nobody really cares about, but there's really all lakes in Texas are man made. They're all oh. dammed from the rivers. Yeah, yeah, I never knew that. It was, it was very interesting. I didn't know that. It's the same in Puerto Rico, actually. There are no natural lakes. They're all man-made. Oh, really? Yeah. I knew. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Today, today we're going to have an awesome demo. Thank you, Thomas, for coming on, man. We, I've, I, like I said before, I've saw some some previews, and you and I have gone through the flow. I'm super excited a bit about this. It's going to be a nice pulling a lot of things together that Docker and Sneak have been doing through Hub and CLI and the desktop and all the wonderful things you guys got in and we're going to be seeing some cool stuff. So anything, anything else before we get started, do you want to say hello to anybody? Any shout outs? Uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> okay, awesome. Awesome. Perfect. Hello, everybody. Hello, Jill. Thanks for joining. Um, cool. All right. Well, what do you say? We just jump right into it. All right. Where do you want right. to start? Where do, where should we start? Where, wherever you want. Do you want to just, Right into the demo, right into what are we gonna do? Get clone. We're gonna we're gonna start hacking away, huh? So that's uh, I prepared a demo, of course, and just uh, for a little bit of background, you know, over in 2020 was a very busy year uh, for for Docker and Sneak. We yeah, sure. we kind of embarked on on a partnership with the goal of helping developers, you know, that are building containers do so in a secure fashion. And the way that we, we kicked this off was integrating our scans in the first into Docker desktop, which is, you know, where, what installs the Docker build tools and everything needed to push containers into Docker Hub. And then now that I mentioned Docker Hub, that was the second place that we integrated security scanning into. So we kind of have this, uh, this beginning of the tool chain with Docker desktop where Sneak is present and this almost this trust boundary where right before things are deployed into production, you want to get a good a good sense of the security posture, what's hidden in that container, what vulnerabilities does it contain? Haha, uh -huh. see. Yes. I uh, see what you did there. <laughs> so what what I what we're gonna show today is really an end-to-end -end workflow. Uh, yes, we're gonna show Docker Desktop and Docker Hub, but we also have to consider what fits between those tools. Yeah. I there's GitHub for source control, for example, or whatever source control provider that, that, that the client's using. And then there's all sorts of CI CD systems. Right? They, they all have a, a choice uh, of what CI they want to use. And then after Docker Hub, of course, we have the running container. And these are all places where security can be plugged in. So that's what I'm going to demonstrate today is awesome. that that end to end workflow. And yeah. You know, we can certainly hop right into the demo uh, if uh, if you think well, so. Yeah, 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 we can, and yeah, I think it's I, I think it's and I've been talking about it on the show with with a couple of different folks, but yeah, that thought of moving shifting left, right? At least from the developer's mindset, 
and I don't, I don't know if that's a, if that's a well-known industry term or not, but that's, that's how we talk about it internally. Mm -hmm. All right. Shifting left to the developer, start thinking about security earlier. I think it's a, we're in a little bit of a different ball game over the next, over these past couple of years, right? Where it used to be, you know, you're running in VMs. Those were up and running forever. You know, there's a lot of security concerns around that. And really developer almost just had to focus on their application, right? Mm -hmm. and, and not worry about, and, and I'll put not worry, right? Because we all should have been worrying about it, but, but honestly we didn't, right? And we always left it to the end. We always had another team that, uh, a lot of times we just step in the end and say, well, 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 we have to run all of our security scans before you do anything, right? And, oh, well, we have a launch in three days. Um, should have thought about this before. But um, yeah, so shifting left, thinking about security earlier, and then the partnership with you guys just uh, is just great, right? Because it just makes it a lot more seamless. And 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 we've talked a lot about the left, but I love how you're going to show a, a more integrated, a more holistic view of everything, right? Yeah. So yeah, perfect. Yeah, and you're and you're spot on, right? The the recent shift left, which is a pretty well known in the industry term, it's is picking up popularity is because security organizations just don't have as much staff as development organizations. There was a there's a ratio I saw in a lightning talk. Uh, for every hundred developers, there's ten ops people and there's one security person. So shifting security left is effectively a way of scaling security. Because all the things, to your point, instead of waiting to the end uh, yeah. to, to implement security, it's now being thought of from the ground from the ground up. Right. And, and right. you know, the we've been starting off. Uh, you know, our our founder has a fantastic talk about this, um, about how so for a lot of companies, shifting left is not enough. Um, because yeah. you know, yes, put security into the hands of the developers, but think about all the other stakeholders across the SDLC, right? You have operations people that are in charge of keeping the pipelines running and meeting the delivery targets. You have the security people that you mentioned yeah. that are responsible for the security of the production environment. So all these stakeholders, if they can participate in the process, that is how you stream, you, you what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Use your words, Tomas. That's how you scale yeah. uh, security effectively. And that's what we're gonna show today. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, let's let's jump into it. I'm, All right, I'm, I'm waiting with bated breath, as my mom okay. used to say. So let's do it. I I would. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. You should see all of us now. Now, I was gonna start with some slides because you're in Texas, and I would have loved to start with a slide full of bullets. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not gonna start with slides. Instead, I'm gonna start with a GitHub repository. This is open to anybody if you wanna follow along or next week we'll be publishing a hands-on workshop that you'll be able to follow this demonstration through end-to-end. -end. And just so I didn't prepare this in advance, I, I'm gonna be doing the entire demo from scratch. So if something breaks, we can have fun with it. Awesome, and awesome. We'll fix it. So. And I'm just going to start that we had this template repository, uh, which means you can just import it into your GitHub very easily, call it whatever you want. And what this is going to do is it's going to clone everything you need into your GitHub that you need to build a containerized application. Now, this Eric, is uh, Thomas, I'm sorry. Can, can you, I was looking at Eric. Thank you for joining us, Eric. Thomas, can you bump your, um, yeah, zoom in just a little bit in your, in your browser for me? Sure. Yeah. Make it bigger. Perfect. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you for letting me know. No worries. So this is a deliberately, it's it's our vulnerable demo application. So please do not deploy this into a production environment. <laughs> uh, it is very, very vulnerable. It, and it's like that by design because we want to show how there's different aspects to application security. You hear about securing the source code. You hear about securing the open source components. You hear about securing the container and everything that it introduces. Securing the infrastructure as code. We'll get into that one in a little bit. But everything you need is in here. Uh, this is a Node.js application. You can tell because we're using a package and a package JSON and a package lock JSON file to manage the open source components. We have a Docker file that we're going to use to pack it into to package it into a container. So straight off, very first thing I want to do is clone this to my, and I will make this bigger, I promise, uh, is clone this into, into my ID. 
That way we can actually get to work on some cool stuff. Let me make this way bigger. Yeah, I was gonna say bump that one up too, please. I got you. Maybe one, maybe one or two more. Ooh, that's really big. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, now, uh, now you can't type, but. <laughs> oh, oh, oh it'll, I'll still be able to type. So okay. now we have all the goodness here. Now this application, it needs um, a Mongo database to run. Now I don't actually have Mongo installed in my computer. Oh no. But this is where we can start talking about the, the magic of containers, right? MongoDB is available as a container. It's very easy to just take Docker run, make it run in the background, expose the MongoDB port, which is 27017, map it to port 27017 on the computer so that the Docker network is tied to the computer's network. And then just type in the name of the container, Mongo. So what this is going to do, it's going to go into Docker Hub, it's going to pull Mongo, and now Mongo's running in the background. If I do a Docker PS, we can kind of see, hey, there's Mongo. And it, it, it gave it a really cool name, Lucid Antonelli. Uh, I love how Docker picks random names for containers. Uh, yeah. That's running. It's great. Yeah. So, little, little side note, if you want to see where those names are picked, you can look right in the source code, and you can see the arrays of them and how, how it does it. It's pretty, pretty interesting. It's the beauty of open source. Right? Yes. So right now uh, we can show, we can run this application locally. Uh, whoops, what happened there? Uh, so if I do node app.js, this is gonna actually try to run the application. If it doesn't work, then oops, I have to figure out why it didn't why it didn't work. And we are we have now officially started off with the very first hiccup of our demonstration. <laughs> nice. <laughs> You know, you can't have a demo without without something breaking along the way, right? Exactly. I, if it, if something doesn't break, is it really a demo? So let me see what's going on here. It says it doesn't like my app.js file. Well, for while you while you troubleshoot, I'll, I'll talk about. Yeah, I I love I love when demos don't go perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Because in the real world, and you know, we were talking about this earlier. People, uh, you know, prof professionally developing and technologists, right? Don't do everything. Sit down and go. Ba -da -da -da, works. Ba -da -da -da, works. You know, that's me typing. By the way, that's a weird typing sound effect. I know. But, um, <laughs> you know, you break things. You forget things. Right? Things don't work right away, and you have to go troubleshoot them, figure them out. Even the most senior uh, engineers out there, right? Yeah. So it's, it, I, lo I love when when we're doing demos and walking through things. You know, we get a little hiccups here and there. Yeah. So in this case, what I'm what I'm gonna do is make sure that all the packages needed to run the application are installed locally. Should have done this at first, but Mark. you know, yeah, when when you're on the spot, you don't really think about these things. And then after that, I'm gonna run it. If it doesn't run, I do have a plan B. I have a container available. You know, that's the the beauty of of a container is it's really oh, I just pull it down, I can run it, great. You know, as long as I have a Docker, a Docker daemon running. Oh, uh, for those of you that want to follow along with the demonstration, I do have Docker Desktop installed, and I will be using the Kubernetes cluster that Docker Desktop embeds. So you are going to need to have the Kubernetes cluster that Docker Desktop ships enabled uh, to to do this demonstration. Just the, the little disclaimer uh, yeah. Yeah. in there. So, but you're totally right. And like it's this is very much indicative of, of the little video you played at the beginning. Uh, right. was, oh, it's working on my computer, but it's not working in production. But it works over here. What's yeah. going? On? You know, you yeah. need to, the environment. There's there's an environment drift that can definitely happen. In this case, what the environment my GitHub repository was expecting, and what I actually had on my computer was different. So yeah, aha, containers. Yeah. Containers and, and another and another over maybe overlooked as people have used Docker for a while, right? That simplicity of just where you ran the Mongo database in, in a container, like that, right? Is it's so powerful? It's so simple, but it's so powerful, right? It's you know having to install Mongo local, then if you run MySQL or Postgres or you know having these things all installed local, how, how to manage across your different projects and across. Now we're doing, you know, microservices with separate data stores. By the yep. way, if you're doing a microservice, you should not be sharing data stores with other services. That's not how you do data share. But anyways, right? And so you have all these databases everywhere, and to be able to, to bring that environment up using containers, 
I, I mean, it's priceless to, to do the, what is that, the Visa commercial? The old Visa commercial? No, uh, MasterCard, I think, right? MasterCard. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, thank you for, for help with the commentary because now we have a working app. Awesome. Uh, this is running as a node app, uh, so I don't actually have have it packaged in a container. This is a basic to-do list. It looks innocent. You can just keep adding different tasks in here. You can see kind of the rest calls that happen in the background. So this is the app interacting with the underlying MongoDB store. So we, we've tested the app works. I'm going to go ahead and kill it. You know it's dead because if I refresh, oh, no, it's gone. And let's now package this into, into a container. So I'm going to go ahead and kick off the Docker build process. Uh, Tom Gonzo is my Docker Hub username. We're going to call it Goof. And we're going to tag this develop or dev. Now, while it builds, uh, so a little bit about the Docker file that, that I'm using. Um, I think it doesn't actually like that my screen is so zoomed in. Because uh, oh, that or VS Code is just deciding to not work with me today, which is fine. It won't, it won't open your uh, Docker file? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's always a fix. This is why you have multiple multiple programs uh, that can that can really, you know, help you do the same thing. And man, the, the, the demo guards are not happy with you, Thomas. They really are not. <laughs> they will not let you open a text. A text. They're, they're putting me on the spot, really. Uh, it's it's baffling, but it's okay. You know, that's indicative of of the normal experience for a lot of people. So let me zoom this in. So we're just taking a node base image. Uh, and in there, we're going to create a directory where our, all our application files are going to be copied in. And then we're going to run what I had to do to get it working on my local environment, get the NPM update, the NPM install up and running. The application needs these two ports to work. And it launches with NPM start. Awesome. So what Docker build is doing is just that. You can kind of see it work. It loads the base image. It copies in all the application binaries into it. And then it'll, when I do Docker run later down the line, that's what's, that's what's going to work. It, it's just going to do NPM, NPM start. Awesome. So yeah, some, uh, some science, you know, Perfect. now our containers build. Yay. Awesome. So if we go to Docker images. We'll see it there now. I am, you do need to, if you're going to deploy this to an orchestrated environment like Kubernetes, even the one in Docker desktop, it's good to, to have it in uh, a container registry. So of course, we're going to go ahead and Docker push this uh, to Docker Hub. And what that's going to do is it's going to store it in Docker Hub. Now, earlier in the conversation, I brought up Docker Hub as kind of this trust boundary. You know, if you think about it this way, if you're not using the Kubernetes in Docker desktop, you're likely using a Kubernetes cluster on AWS, on Azure, on Google, on IBM, or an OpenShift cluster. You know, the container registry really is that final point uh, before the application is deployed into a production environment. So that's why I'm putting it up there, because I'm about to A, deploy it into a production environment. But it's really going to give us a good opportunity to look at, once it's pushed into the security scanning, uh, by sneak that we've embedded into Docker Hub, right? Uh, right. Once it once it gets pushed in. Now there's going to be no, you you've seen so far. There's no smoke and mirrors here. There's yes. <laughs> this this has already been a wild roller coaster of a demonstration, and you know go. Let's, let's go ahead. And, let's make sure everything pushed to Docker Hub correctly. Uh, of course, I should not use an incognito tab because if I use an incognito tab, it's going to ask me to log in, and then I have to remember my password. So. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want that. We don't want that. So here's Goof. Yay. This is the container I just updated. Now, one thing I'm going to do is within the settings, enabling vulnerability scanning just takes a click. You do that. And now anytime you push an image into Docker, into this particular repository, it'll get scanned for vulnerabilities with Sneak. That's all, really, that's all you have to do to really enable vulnerability scanning. So. Next up, uh, we have to, we're we're gonna test it. We have it in a container. We want to make sure it's gonna work. So again, I don't know why VS Code's not letting me open things uh, internally. I might have to restart it in a second. But this is the YAML file that deploys this to Kubernetes. For those of you that are following along or that are gonna check out the lab, all you have to do is put your Docker ID in. 
into the YAML file, telling Kubernetes, hey, this is the this is the container that you're going to be deploying for Goof. And then there's a there's a handy little script in here called kubestart that is essentially going to create the namespace where the container is going to be deployed. It's going to set the context so that any uh, kubectl commands that we run are executed against that namespace. And then it's going to create the MongoDB instance, similar to the one that I showed at the very beginning on my local environment. And it's going to spin up Goof. Once that's up and running, I if the demo gods like me, there it is. Awesome. There's my running application in Kubernetes. I can see it running if I do kubectl get pods. There's my two. There's my two containers. Yay! Yeah. Right. Success. So we have set the stage. Uh, let's make sure this works. Cool. We set the stage now for some automation. You know, let's think about a, a continuous delivery scenario. Uh, a lot of companies are embracing this concept of continuous integration, continuous delivery. And sitting at the center of that, in many cases, is some sort of source control repository that manages different branches, different versions of the code. Right. So this is my, my develop branch for my repository. This is where I'm actually going to be making changes to the code. Uh, if I wanted to create a branch that represents the deploy ready state of my code for my production environment, I do that in GitHub. So now I have two branches, one for develop, one for production. And what this is going to let me do is it's going to let me track the deployment ready state of the code and the, and the state of the code that might be unstable because I'm actively working on it. Right. Now, this, awesome. is, imp this is important because, or I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. In, in Docker Hub, uh, in that Goof repository that, that I just built, there's a really neat functionality called auto build where if you connect this to the GitHub repository where the application lives, uh, you can actually tell it, hey, I want to monitor my production branch for changes and automatically build the production tag of my container image anytime nice. changes are, push, are pushed to that branch. So what I'm going to have here in Docker Hub, once this build completes, is I'm going to have the tag for my development uh, tag, uh, which is the container that I'm working on on my local desktop. It's where I do my prototyping. This is where I make sure that things work. And then once the build completes, I'm going to have a second tag, which is representative of the container that I want to deploy into a production environment. And this is this is one of one of the things I really appreciate about about containers. It's so easy to really have multiple versions of the same code base um, that are that are apt for different environments. So going to take a second to build, but I wanted to pause. Do you see any anything in any questions in the chat or anything that have been that have been launched at us so far that we can get into? Yeah. Um, well, we just got we just got one. Bring it up on the screen here. So not wearing pants. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Uh, <laughs> you know, we'll just leave that aside. We'll set that aside for a second. But uh, is Docker's going against CIs, weird decision. Oh, uh, you mean setting up in a, in a business decision or a business um, uh, direction? No, not really. We, we've had auto builds and auto tests in Hub for, for a long time. Um, we're adding improvements to them and stuff. But the idea is to meet our customers where they're at, right? So if they're whatever C, CI provider they're using, right? We want to we want to do smart integrations that make sense for both for both companies and partners, right? And if, if you kind of think of, at Docker, we kind of think of uh, the container as the vehicle, right? So if you think about the, the software pipeline as the highway, and this is going to be a, a horrible analogy, so bear with me, but right, really the container is the car, the 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 uh, eighteen wheeler the truck that's moving down the highway, right? And you can go on different highways and at different points you have, um, you know, toll roads and, or off, you know, uh, we call them caliche roads here in Texas. They're uh, the rock roads, but, um, right? And, and so Docker should be able to seamlessly fit into to any of those through containers, right? And so that's our goal is to integrate with uh, ecosystem partners and deliver great developer experiences for wherever you're at, right? Mm -hmm. And so, no, we're not we're not setting out to to um, you know build the world's greatest uh, you know CI provider. Although we do want to improve auto builds, right? If you're in Hub now, one of the great features you get is auto builds, right? It's um, 
if you have a hub subscription, you're storing your images there, you're using official images, and then you're building other places, right? If you're doing, um, you know, 80 20 rule, right? Hub can manage 80% of the CI CD builds and needs that you have, right? So why not just stay right there instead of, um, you know, buying, you know, 10 different SASs is one option. Um, but then also, on, conversely, right, I, I think there's definitely um, a huge place in the industry for separation concerns, right? Mm -hmm. So you do have your code repository, you're uh, managing your code, you're managing your images, and you could also manage your CI process in a different process, right? And keep those separation concerns. So I know yeah. that was a long-winded answer, but ho hopefully that that answered uh, the question or, or the, the ask there, not wearing pants. And yeah. please put some pants on or... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your question. Awesome. That was a great question. And I want to I want to add a note and you know, you you nailed it when you said separation of duties. Uh, I will I am not replacing CI with auto build. I am going to be I do have a, two GitHub actions workflows that run CI within GitHub. So when chain and these these two workflows are meant to execute whenever a pull request is open to the production branch. So I have a CI workflow that builds the container and tests it. So it builds the app, it builds the container as a way to check that what's being merged into production is kosher. Right. And then once it's in production, that's, that's when the Docker Hub auto build picks it up. So once something's merged into production, it should be assumed that it's production ready. And right. So what I'm doing here, uh, GitHub Actions charges by the minute. Uh, auto build is included with my Docker Hub subscription. What I'm doing here is saving a few extra bucks. Yeah. Um, you know, over the course of potentially hundreds of container builds a week, right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, you think about if your if your teams at an organization are, are doing this very often, right? And uh, yeah, I know we talk about in the industry. Uh, we deploy, you know, a hundred times a day. I don't know. That's maybe. <laughs> That's yeah. like something to shoot for, but but folks are moving in that direction. Teams are moving yes. in that direction, right? A building, a building, a building, a hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. And so Microsoft says package, you know, uh, microservices. You know, in yeah. one project, you could be doing that a ton. Now, you know, ten x that right across all your services. Mm -hmm. So, and this is, this is the result. Uh, so right now, it j this just my prod image just got pushed to Docker Hub. This pull that just happened a second ago is the sneak security scan that's going to be running under the covers. Uh, so once the security scan completes, I'm going to see the vulnerabilities here, and that's going to tell me if there's any vulnerabilities within the within the open source components in that container image. Now, you know, when when we talk about vulnerabilities, there's really a lot of things to consider, right? It's the components brought in by your base image. Typically, these are Linux packages that the base image brings in. There's also the components that are brought in by the application, which as I showed at the beginning of the demo, we have a package.json file that's chock full of open source components with vulnerabilities on purpose. And then there's also other risks, maybe not necessarily vulnerabilities, but risks of misconfiguration um, of how that container is actually deployed into a production environment. So, you know, right. It, but it's really what we're doing here is providing visibility. And once the scan finishes running, we're gonna we're gonna see it here. But what we're providing is visibility. You know, developers usually live in their IDEs and in GitHub. You yeah. know, but then you have other personas, operations personas, or maybe security personas. There we go. That are looking at Docker Hub as a way to know what did the developers actually give me. Right that I'm about to throw into my production environment. In this case, 3,000 high severity vulnerabilities, 5,000 mediums, and 111 nodes. Ship it. That, yeah, ship it. Let's go <laughs> ahead and push that into production. <laughs> now that's, uh, but, you know, so how do we get here? How did we get here? We just took an application that looked like it worked, and because it worked, we assume that, yes, this application is safe, and we pushed it, and now we know, no, it's not actually safe. So what can we do about it? So I'm going to start us off in Sneak. Uh, so within Sneak, if I, I, I have a GitHub integration, so much like Docker Hub authenticated with, uh, with my GitHub repository, I can also come into Sneak 
and I can I can import the Docker workshop repository. And what this is going to do, the sneak's going to reach out to to my GitHub. It's going to find those manifest files that I called out, the Docker file, the package JSON file, as well as the configuration files that control how the application is deployed into Kubernetes. And it's going to tell me, yo, where are the vulnerabilities that you have? So this is kind of how Sneak has operated. Uh, so I'm not, right now, this is just typical Sneak operation. There, this is how it's. we've been doing it for years. Right. What's really new and exciting, though, is you don't really have to go into Sneak to do this anymore. So yes, Sneak will tell you about, about these files. But one of the things that we've done recently, if I go back to my terminal, I, is embed Sneak scans right within the Docker CLI. And you can scan a container just like you would do Docker build. You can do Docker scan. And then type the name of the image that you want to use. Optionally, you can pass the Docker file that you use to construct it. And what this is going to do under the covers, it's running the Sneak CLI. So the same Sneak CLI that you would get if you if you were a daily user of Sneak is bundled right into Docker's tools. And what this is doing is it's looking at the dependencies of your container image to find what are the vulnerabilities that are present in here. But there's, there's going to be... You know, the logical next question is, okay, I have vulnerabilities, now what? You know, so we try to focus on making it easy to spend less time triaging the vulnerabilities and more time actually fixing the vulnerabilities. And so what we're going to see once Docker scan completes is Sneak is going to tell us how to do just that. I don't want to spoil it uh, <laughs> before it shows up because I think it's kind of cool. But that, but that is, I mean, to your point, right? If I come in as a developer and I go, well, 3,000 vulnerabilities, well, you know, I'm not a security professional, right? I, I, I don't know what uh, the CVs mean and all that, right? So it's, this is super cool and here it goes. Look at um, all those vulnerabilities. <laughs> and yes, now I, I, I love that we just don't, oh yeah, hey, you got a bunch of vulnerabilities, good luck, yeah. right? We're gonna, Sneak helps you out here, right? Yeah. So if, if you and if you look at them, I uh, well, sneak tells you, okay, you know, this is the vulnerability. This is the package that brought that brought it in, and here's a version of the package that you can upgrade to uh, to fix this vulnerability. But imagine having to go one by one through all these packages and start upgrading your container's base image dependencies. Like, yes, you can do it. A lot of organizations do build golden images, uh, golden base images, similar to how you know, you used to build golden VM images or ISOs, as the video called it out at the beginning. <laughs> but we're taking a slightly different approach. What we're doing is we're, at, we're recommending, hey, upgrade your base image. Like right now, you're using a, a base image, Node 10.4, with 950 vulnerabilities, over 400, uh, 449 of them are high. You can upgrade to 10.23.1, and that'll take you down to 569. It's still a big number, but you can annihilate over 390 high severity vulnerabilities just by upgrading your base image. Yeah. And this is big, you know, because instead of having to go one by one, and of course I have to go back into Sublime to do this because VS Code's not being nice, you know, I, I can either comment or delete out the, the old from statement. Remember, I want to test it locally, so I want to keep it there just in case this doesn't work. Upgrading your base image is not guaranteed to work. You should always know what your application's dependencies are um, and what components it actually needs from the base image before you do this. In this case, I've uh, you know I've practiced this demo this demo enough in other situations that I know that if I upgrade to node uh, you know twenty three ten dot twenty three dot one, then it's actually going to work. But what I'll do then is all right, you know. We're now going to do Docker build again, and we're going to build the goof container, same tag. But this time, it's going to build it with node 10.23.1. Awesome. So we got a quick question here. We could probably, well, this is building. Sure. So is this similar to NPM audit? Similar, yes. Uh, so NPM audit actually looks at the, at the package JSON file. 
Um, so it'll tell you if there's anything wrong with the NPM packages themselves that you're utilizing. In this case, um, the vulnerabilities identified from the base image, these are not NPM vulnerabilities. Right. These are vulnerabilities in the Linux packages themselves of the base image. Right, right. Um, yeah, so it's, it's similar in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the thought that it's scanning for vulnerabilities, but different into uh, its scope. But although, although Sneak will, you, you, I think you do have features that do look at NPM packages and, and mm -hmm. Python packages and such. But yeah, but NPM won't look at your base images, won't scan your base images. Um, anything you put, and not only your base image, but the image you create, you know, what you're adding into the image, um, you know, you're putting text editors into your image and, and yeah. didn't realize it, right? things like that. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic question. And that's that's why, why it's important to not only think about what vulnerabilities you're introducing through your application, which NPM audit can certainly help you with, but also your container base image. And then later on, we'll see a little bit about, you know, uh, the, the actual de YAML definition that I use to deploy this into Kubernetes. There's a lot of ways that you can construct those YAML files wrong. That, right. will leave your, that will leave your container vulnerable. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, push this into Docker Hub uh, just, to, just to you know have it in there. Because one thing that, that's interesting about Kubernetes, and of course, got to open it in Sublime, you can set an image pool policy uh, so that you can, make, you can tell Kubernetes whenever it spins up a container to essentially always pull the latest version of an image. In a continuous deployment scenario, uh, you always uh, where you want to be testing the latest version of an image, or or maybe you have a canary rollout. Sure, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can get creative with your Kubernetes rollouts. Yep. You want to make sure that you're running the image that you actually want to test against. In this case, I want to test that the base image that I chose actually works for my application. So what I'm going to do, I'm pushing it to Docker Hub. Once it pushes to Docker Hub. What I'm going to do is I'm going to scale the container in Kubernetes down uh, to zero replicas, so effectively get rid of the application in my cluster. And I'm going to scale it back back up to one or two or three, however many I want. And what that's going to do is put push that latest version of the container that I have in Docker Hub into my cluster. Nice. And I'll be able to test it. So of awesome. course, um, we're we're waiting here. Oh no! See, this isn't something I broke. Like it's trying to do something. It wasn't me this time. It's the it's the internet. I blame the internet. Yes, everybody works from home, right? Watching yeah. Netflix. Yeah, every every time before I get on a show, I have to go out, and all, all my kids are doing school from home. And uh, um, my my wife was helping an an aunt at a hospital last night, so she's sleeping. So the the younger ones are watching TV. Yeah, so we got the TV, of course, is going over the internet nowadays, right? And then I got teens that are on high school on Zoom, and I'm like, okay, everybody's kicked off, and I kick everybody off, but um, they still go on, but, you know. Yeah, so in this case, it worked. So telling your wife and kids to turn off the TVs worked. Thank you. <laughs> wouldn't, it, wouldn't that be easy if we could just do that and all our demos work? You're right. That would be the best. So this is what I was talking about. You know, scaling the deployment down to zero. If I if I try to get the pods, I'm actually not going to see the goof deployment, and scale it back up to one. That's actually going to spin the container back up in Kubernetes. There it is, running for four seconds. If I go back to my sample application and refresh, yeah, it's there. Woo! It worked. So my application's now now running with a more secure base image. You know, and we know because we've effectively made those invisible risks that our container base image brought invisible, that even though the application looks and behaves the same, it actually has 500 less vulnerabilities yep. than, than what it used to have, which is fascinating. Now, yeah. back in Docker Hub, you know, uh, because I enabled vulnerability scanning, if I refresh my Docker Hub repo, I should now see the scan results. For, if it doesn't, it's still scanning it. But I'm going to be able to see the scan results side by side between my production image and my development image, which is immediately going to give my anybody that's using Docker Hub with me. I'm a developer. So if anybody that's using Docker Hub to keep track of my work 
sees that the development image is more secure than the image that's in production, that's a way of making my work visible, right? And getting my security and my ops people excited about, oh my God, you're actually fixing things. Right. So that's, uh, that's what we can expect to see here once the, once the scan finishes running. It might take a little bit, but you know, while it, while it runs, I am gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, and commit my changes to GitHub. Uh, because I want to make sure I want to show that that's that you know Docker Hub isn't replacing CI. You can still use CI as part of your workflows here. So let me go ahead and commit this. It's like new base image. Yay! If I put an exclamation mark, I learned uh, that it doesn't actually work. <laughs> hey, look what started working! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna push my changes up to GitHub. VS Code was just taking a little nap. It was yeah, CS the time for for VS Code. Yeah, I need a more powerful computer. That's what it is. I hope my boss is watching. <laughs> Give me one of those, one of those M1 things. machines, right? Yeah, exactly. Read my mind. <laughs> so if I go to back to my Docker Workshop repo in my develop branch. I should be able to see that my Docker file just a few seconds ago received an update. Now let's see if the vulnerability scan in Docker Hub kicked on and finish. Look at that. Nice. Many, many less vulnerabilities than what's in production. So let's go ahead and open a pull request. Now, this is where auto build coexists with CI. So I'm kind of going to put my money where my mouth is here. We're going to merge the changes from develop to prod. This is the base image upgrade that we did. It also has the, you know, my Docker ID in the Kubernetes manifest, which is fine. And this is where things get really interesting. Because we set up the sneak integration, there's a reason I imported the project into sneak. Because we set up the sneak integration uh, as part of a pull request, now what GitHub is going to do is it's going to look at the last snapshot that I had of that scan, and it's going to ask me, or it's going to check, are you introducing any new security vulnerabilities that weren't already there? In this case, I'm not. Are you introducing any new license uh, restrict any components with open source licenses that are restricted as part of this pull request. No, that's not true. So those two are going to pass. Now, the reason I have GitHub Actions running as part of this is because there are still open source vulnerabilities in my application. So I want I set up a sneak action that fails. I'm going to go to the workflow file so, so you can kind of see what, what, it, what it's doing under the covers. So what this is doing is it's failing if there are any high severity vulnerabilities that have a fix available. What we mean by a fix available, if I if I go if I take you back into sneak and we look at our package JSON file, which is what that's checking for, I'm it's sorry, saying I'm sorry, Thomas, bump, bump that uh, your browser up just a tiny bit. Sure. In this screen? Uh, uh in the sneak. Okay. Yeah. So what, thank you. Hey, thank you for, for letting me know again. Yeah. Uh, so the reason this is failing, there are high severity vulnerabilities that were fixed in a particular package version. And that's why my, my GitHub Actions check failed. Now, it's kind of easy to upgrade apply these fixes. You just upgrade to a particular version of an open source component. As a developer, you know, back in my IDE, if I look at my package.json file, uh, let's see if VS Code decides to do it this time. Fingers crossed, because this would be really cool to show it. If it is, if not, we'll keep moving past it. Open it. <laughs> there it is. Oh, cool. So here's our, our package JSON file. And we have a we sneak has a, a plugin for VS Code called Volncost that as you're looking over your package JSON file, you can see what has vulnerabilities. You know, so it's telling you where the components are that, that have vulnerabilities. Cool. Now, it's sometimes very easy to think, ah, open source components have vulnerabilities. What's the impact of that? Well, I'm going to show you. So for those that want to do this, there is a directory in here full of exploits um, for a lot of these vulnerabilities. So in this case, I have a directory traversal vulnerability. That's one of my favorite ones uh, to show. I'm going to source the, the file that uh, that effectively contains what I need to what I need for that. I'm going to load it up so you can see uh, how this actually works. 
So what it's doing, it's doing, it's a set of curl calls. It's going to call our application and the directory traversal vulnerability. If I go back into sneak to kind of, to show you what that's about, it, it's actually a medium severity vulnerability. It's not a high, but still my, still one of my favorite ones. It lets you leak contents of sensitive files in the application, which in this case, the example that, that I'm going to be using is the contents of the Etsy password file. Nice. So what, is this, what does this look like in practice? You know, a normal, a normal curl, curl request, like here I'm calling, oh, just get me the about.html file. This is great. You know, if I find, if I do row number four in the exploit, this is going to tell me, look, these are the folders that are in the file system of my computer overall that's running of my container. I mean, that's running my application, bad juju. Yeah. If I run the full exploit, there it is. This is the contents of my password file uh, that are that are effectively being leaked because of the way that this particular open source component handles the payload that I'm sending into it. And a, a lot of these risks stay invisible. But you know, this is what Sneak's all about. If I if I go back to my package JSON file, I go to the fix vulnerabilities or learn about this vulnerability. La la la. I had it right the first time. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> um, so sneak, it'll actually tell you, hey, look, here's your directory traversal vulnerability. You can fix it by upgrading the package to version 1.2.2. So yeah, sure, why not? 1.2.2, save. I'm going to rescan it for vulnerabilities, and then it's going to be way happier with me uh, once I actually rebuild the application. So let's take a look at, at what that looks like. So I'm going to just go back and do Docker build because I go ahead and, you know, whoops, I got to go back to the folder outside of the exploits one. I'm going to rebuild my container image. This is going to have the version 1.2.2 of the open source component. Again, I'm building it locally because it's so important to test that the that it that a change in an open source dependency still works don't assume that it's going to work like just because it's the same major version the same minor version it's always important to test yeah 100 percent. that it works yeah and, the, yeah those are the ones where you start pulling your hair out and, you, and everybody's going well the code didn't change nothing you know and everybody's going well what changed last and everybody doesn't think oh well i just you know i ticked up a version right because mm -hmm. yeah it, it's those are those are the those are the fun ones to try and track down. Yeah, and you know it's it's very hard to troubleshoot sometimes. And the video that you played at the beginning said the said the same thing. It's like oh, prod and dev are the same. Well, except I bumped up a few minor versions of some libraries. <laughs> exactly. That's a very real scenario uh, at a lot of companies. Absolutely, absolutely. Especially with npm packages and when you're and when we didn't have lock files and and those type of things. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, you would get minor versions out all over the place, all over the place. Okay. And as a developer, right, a lot of times you're just thinking, well, just my code, right? This is just what I changed, right? And that's your kind of narrow focus, right? Right. So you know, here, and that that's exactly right. You know, developers are responsible for this. This is the developer's areas of responsibility. It's not just you know, uh, the, the custom code that they write, they have to really be aware and cognizant of the risks that their choice of open source libraries bring into yeah. the code base. Yeah. Uh, so right now I'm repushing the image to Docker Hub. Once it's done pushing, uh, this is, we're going to be able to redeploy it into Kubernetes, make sure that, up, that bumping up this library did in fact help uh, this vulnerability uh, not be exploitable anymore. And we're, we're going to be able to, so let me go find my kubectl command, scale this down to zero replicas. So now the container is gone, or it will be, and scale this back up to one replica. And let's try that same exploit that, that I ran earlier after making sure that our application's up and running. So let me go back to my to-do list application. Here it is, refresh. All right, is that, yay, it's still here. So if I go back over here and I try to do the, the first exploit, this is a normal thing. Great, that one works. If I try to do one that lists the directories, um, whoops, I'm going to get a forbidden. Look at that. 
I bumped up an open source package and that vulnerability is no longer in my code base. Nice. Like wild. So I like this. I want this change. So I'm going to go ahead and commit this or first add, right? And then, then I'm going to commit this change to GitHub. And it's going to be like new ST library to fix dire directory traversal. And push that change up to GitHub. Now, what's really interesting about CI, uh, particularly GitHub Actions, but this applies to CI in general, is once I submit this to my develop branch and it pushes uh, the code into develop, it'll add it to the commits that are part of the pull request that I opened earlier, and it's going to rerun the CI tests. So you, the idea is you would rinse and repeat this process you know, until the open source vulnerabilities that are fixable in high severity have been addressed. But you know, you can always override this. At any time, I can merge this pull request if I really wanted to. But at least I know that, hey, I'm accepting this risk. Right. And I'm introducing it into my code base. Yeah, eyes wide open, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. if, I, if I go into sneak, notice my vulnerability counts 35, 27, and 5. If I retest that package.json file, which happens automatically every day, um, and there's also a webhook that retests it automatically every time a new version of it is pushed, then that directory traversal vulnerability, if I control F and I try to find it, should not be present. Awesome. So, you know, that's uh, that's one way to to address the open source vulnerabilities that that are present. And the idea is, if I wanted to fix all of these at once, I can definitely tell Sneak, hey, open a fix pull request. And Sneak will literally upgrade all my dependencies to fix all these vulnerabilities at once. It's not a good idea to upgrade 50 dependencies at once for the reasons that we talked about. But this is the kind of workflow that we're looking to enable, is you go, in, you go into Sneak, you find a vulnerability that you want to fix, you click Fix, it opens a pull request, that pull request kicks off your CI workflows. Once the CI workflows are kicked off and you're happy, you merge that into production. Once you merge it into production, Docker Hub picks it up, rescans the image, and voila, you have a safer container. Nice. Awesome. Woo. And, and then and then you go, ta-da. Yeah. In a in the deploy in the in the go no go meeting, right? Exactly. <laughs> So I know that was a mouthful. Cool. Um, but you know, no, I, did I miss no, any questions or anything in the chat? Uh, Eric, Eric in uh, not wearing pants. Uh, Eric is is a, um, a dev advocate with Sneak, um, and they're having a great discussion around uh, talking about um, adding inter uh, vulnerabilities or security concerns around secrets and those type of things. And talking about um, scanning those, right? Base images should they help developers later down the chain not in, not um, mm -hmm. inject secrets and file systems uh, files into your into your image, mm -hmm. um, which is an interesting conversation, right? It's um, you know how how much do you uh, handhold or guide rail uh, people that are using your software, right? Or do you give a set of tools, right? Like a, a saw, right? A saw can be very powerful to, to build how homes, but it can be also very dangerous and you know lose fingers or or, or something, mm -hmm. right? Um, so yeah, it's an interesting conversation they're having over there. Yeah. Having. And I I have a question. So well, not a question, just a comment, right? So we're going we're going very fast and and very clear, but it's a lot. It's a lot uh, for it's folks hot. watching, right? And it yeah. seems. Uh, it, it could probably seem very complex, and it is, but it's also simple when you think about it, right? And through these processes, I, I would I would definitely recommend, uh, you know, walking through this yourself, right? True, really understanding it. Get into uh, join the Docker community, ask us questions in there, and also get into the Sneak community. And I'm gonna drop I'll drop these links in the chat, um, but join the Sneak community. Connect into the folks out there, ask your questions, right, and get help, right? Don't don't sit. Uh, all alone, right? Especially when we're at home and, and trying to figure these things out. Yes, uh, please. You know, CICD, Docker, uh, security scanning, right? These are complex things, right? These are not easy. Um, and all you have to do is don't ask, don't worry about asking questions, right? Do your research and ask good questions, but 
um, do ask the questions. It's a balance between um, figuring stuff out on your own, but knowing when you you're stuck, right? And asking folks that can, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. And you're, you know, we we try to make ourselves as accessible as possible. You can reach out to us using Intercom, uh, right within the Sneak application. If you have any questions, uh, you're there's also what we call the Sneak Academy uh, that shows, you know, this is where I'm going to be dropping in this workshop. Um, how to use Docker's tools together with Sneak. It's hands-on. It's got lots of pretty pictures uh, and all the commands that you can copy pasta uh, to make it all work. Uh, and we have them for various vendors. We have a GitHub workshop, an Azure workshop, a Red Hat workshop, an Atlassian ecosystem, because there's no one set of tools that will be present everywhere. You know, there's different CI systems, different source control systems, different everything. Yep. So uh, we try to make it as easy as possible. Of course, intercom is accessible within here as well. So absolutely great point. If there's any questions, please reach out. Yes. And, uh, and I will always say, go to our roadmap. Uh, that is the live roadmap. Our product uh, owners are in there. They're, they view issues. Our, our engineers work on those issues. Right. That is our public roadmap. See what's coming up next. Vote on things. Add in issues, features that you would like to see. Uh, joining the conversation there is a great way to get involved and um, help guide where Docker is going with its roadmap. And I, I will tell you 100 percent, this is just not me, you know, uh, fluffing up the community. Absolutely. The engineers are engaged with people that comment um, and interact with them 100 percent. Absolutely. And follow Sneak on Twitter, of course. Um, get all their, uh, you know, stay up to date all changes, announcements, all those type of things. We're going to be having some more um, uh, workshops and interaction with Sneak and showing more in depth of a lot of our partnership. Uh, super excited about. But yeah, Thomas, thank you so much. What did I forget? What, what am I missing? I, I Oh, uh, the Sneak blog. I'm going to put I'm going to drop some of these um, links into the chat so people can can actually click on them. I have the I have the powers in the chat to drop links. The rest of you will your links will be blocked. So um but yeah please go to the blog stay stay informed stay up to date go get go sign up for a free account um and with sneak uh get a free account um and then go to hub docker hub uh hub.docker.com and get a free Docker ID um that gives you access. Uh, log in. We have some restrictions and rate limitings and different things around our free and anonymous users. Um, anonymous, of course, you're at the lowest, but once you're free, th those limits double, right? So just by authenticating with a Docker ID mm -hmm. uh, gives you so many more scans and, and those type of features. So yeah. definitely recommend doing that. Um, again, if you have an M1 machine, join our uh, developer preview program. We have a build for uh, Docker desktop for the M1 machines. Um, it's not ready for uh, ready for production yet, but um, you know you can get the latest. You can start building things and help us out. See where issues are. We're still waiting for both sides. We're it's moving along very very fast. It seems like every couple of days I'm able to get a new build and, and play around with it. It's pretty decently stable right now. Um, but yeah, Thomas, thank you so much. This is great. We need to do this again. Would would you come back? Will you please be a repeat guest? Yeah, totally. Uh, like we're we're working on so much cool stuff for 2021. I would be surprised if we didn't do another one of yes. these. We're not doing our jobs if we don't if we don't talk like this again, right? Exactly. Awesome. Again, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for joining in and and joining in the chat. Um, have an awesome weekend. Stay safe. Awesome. Bye now. <laughs>